Hi, everybody. Welcome to the virtual production panel. Uh, my name is Nancy Bassey. Um, I'm a veteran in the media entertainment industry for 25 years. I spent um, 10 years in uh, economic development for the city of Vancouver and 20 years in film, mostly in visual effects and animation. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, a virtual production is very dear to my heart. Um, I'm excited to see how things are moving along. And what we see is virtual and real-time production techniques are clearly revolutionizing the film industry. And Vancouver having a 40 year history in film and visual effects, animation and games, we are uniquely positioned to be part of this growth sector for the economy. Um, what's interesting is um, there's a lot of unknowns right now about skills gap and, and technology and where we can fit into this pipeline. Does it make movie making easy? Um, what are we doing to ensure that we, our talent is up to speed? Um, so this panel is gonna explore the opportunities and challenges represented by the virtual production industry in Vancouver. And so I'd like to introduce my guests, first of all. First, we have um, Anthony Brown from Amped Technologies. Uh, Anthony is an entrepreneur with over 20 years experience in the infrastructure, I mean, entertainment infrastructure space. And we also have Matt Welford uh, with 25 years of experience in visual effect in a variety of positions. And he currently holds the position of the director of virtual production and creative director at Versatile Media. Welcome, guys. Hi, Nancy. Thank nice to meet you. <laughs> Did I capture it all? Is there anything you want to say about yourselves? Uh, sure. Um, as, as you said, Nancy, uh, uh, somewhere in the range of a couple of decades uh, in, in and around the digital media space. Um, my first company, Seven Group, uh, is pretty well known in digital media. We built a lot of the studios in Canada. All of the things with blinky lights is basically what we did. Um, and then uh, kind of got on the other side of the glass for a little while uh, and was uh, one of Canada's first uh, video game publishing companies. We published a fairly popular title, MechWarrior Online. Um, and, uh, and did very well with that. And, and now Amped is kind of the culmination of those two experiences. Having built out infrastructure in digital media studios, uh, be it animation, visual effects, or video games, and then having to deploy that same type of high performance compute platform for a latency sensitive multi-million player uh, esports game. And that's really what kind of informed us as to what's required to bring this next generation of high performance computing to, to things like virtual production. Great. Matt, what about you? You have a extremely long resume. We don't have much time, but give me, give me some. <laughs> Just yeah. bring up his IMDB slide. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, I know I don't look old enough to have been in the industry uh, for nearly 25 years. Uh, but yeah, I, as you said, I, I started off as an artist uh, working in London, uh, moved to New Zealand where I spent nearly 10 years working for Weather Digital. Um, and I think it's, it's important to note that I think we were we were working on early forms of virtual production way back then, probably 15, uh, over 15 years ago, uh, we were doing uh, what is now considered virtual production um, in pieces. Uh, and 11 years ago, I believe it is now that I moved to Vancouver um, and I've worked for a variety of companies um, as uh, an artist, a visual effects supervisor and head of studio uh, and I've also worked for the studios like Sony Pictures uh, on the client side as a VFX supervisor, mm -hmm. um, which has brought me to, uh, in January, I started with a, a new company called Versatile Media um, as their director of virtual production and creative director, uh, kind of bringing together all of my experiences from visual effects and uh, virtual production um, into uh, mm -hmm. a new company that uh, has located here uh, into Vancouver. And I think the important thing I should also note is Versal Media, whilst it's new here, has actually been uh, in China for nearly 30 years, uh, where they have really been spearheading over the last five or six years, uh, real-time uh, technologies and how to use them uh, in production. Great, thanks. So let's start off by asking the question, what is virtual production? Maybe Matt, since you kind of touched on it, you can start with that because I, I hear there's there's LED screens and then there's animation and then there's running around with a, with an iPad. Like what, what exactly are we talking here? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's, really, it's a, a, an interesting question. What is virtual production? Um, right now, uh, 
pretty much what we hear from everyone is, is oh, LED stages. Um, and what uh, the guys did on Mandalorian, which is absolutely fantastic, is virtual production. And uh, I think, yeah, it's true. That is a part of virtual production. Uh, but really what virtual production is, is the way of combining both physical uh, production and the digital side of production together at the same time um, so that we can literally visualize uh, what is going on. Uh, and we've been doing that for a long time in different ways. Um, and I think the, the coolest thing that has really kind of elevated this over the last five or six years uh, is um, tools like Unreal Engine and Unity um, and these real-time renderers uh, that are now allowing us to take it um, to the point where virtual production uh, allows us to have um, final pixels on the screen at the time that we're shooting uh, physical productions. So you know exactly what you have, so you can move on, I guess. Yeah, I, it's, it's just that amazing thing of uh, actors, directors, um, and other filmmakers being able to see the final product as we're shooting on set, rather than having to wait maybe five, six, seven months uh, before they actually see what something is going to look like. It, it still needs visual effects tweaks at the end usually, doesn't it? Or is that... Uh, is uh, it, it all depends. Or... So there is obviously, there is a, an amount of work now that they are calling in-camera VFX uh, mm -hmm. that does not require kind of any extra work um, aside from the color grading that goes on uh, in post-production. Um, but then the, I know that there is uh, a lot of times that some tweaks do get made. Um, but again, it's uh, very dependent on the production um, and the problems that they're trying to uh, solve with virtual production. Great. So Anthony, where does AMP fit into this pipeline? What, what are you guys supplying? Well, uh, it's the, the same as we've always been. We're on the technology side. So uh, all of the infrastructure that's required to make this stuff work. And, and it, it's, it's quite a bit different than a traditional animation VFX house uh, where you've got your kind of larger re render farms and then your, your various suites, be it, you know, editing or comp or depending on what, whether you guys are into post or, you know, creature creation or what have you. Uh, and, and that's really around the GPUs because you're trying to, you know, uh, do everything in real time, uh, you're dealing with, you know, a, a whole different set of, of hardware. It's not only the infrastructure that's, you know, uh, um, in, the, in the data center and in the compute farm, it's also these tools like an LED wall, um, uh, special uh, camera tracking and calibration systems, controllers. There's, there's all kinds of tech that goes behind the scenes to make things happen in real time. And it's not something that just you know, you're adopting a new methodology and you get a big LED wall and you're off to the races. There's a lot of technology that has to get tweaked and refined uh, uh, to make virtual production work in whatever format you're doing it. Like if you're doing it with an LED wall, uh, you're, you know, you're dealing with all kinds of, of uh, GPU computing uh, to be able to make that work. Um, but even when you're not using an LED wall, uh, you're still trying to get your, your, your visual effects, all of your assets, into a real-time situation. So as, as like Matt said, uh, the director, the cinematographer, the actors are all there getting real-time feedback with realistic real-time um, assets being displayed while they're shooting. Does it make uh, virtual production make content creation um, more accessible or easier? Or um, like who can use this technology? There is some barriers to entry when it comes to certain things. I mean, you know, an LED wall, uh, uh, especially if you're getting a big one, requires a really big space to put it in. Uh, it requires, you know, the, they, they cost millions of dollars to, to purchase one. Um, there, it's, there is a little bit of a barrier to entry depending on what so size and scale you're going with with that technology. <clears throat> that being said, um, the use of real time and use of, of, um, of you know, uh, Unreal Editor as an engine or Unity or what have you uh, to do your real time assets may make it somewhat more accessible for, for smaller groups as well uh, to be able to see what they're creating in a, in a uh, you know, uh, in a preset scene uh, uh, without having to go through a, you know, uh, getting in a, um, 
um, you know, an EXR file that has a, a green screen in the background and doing all your work, you can actually do it with uh, an Unreal Engine editor. And that might be something that, that gets uh, some, some early adopters and, and some smaller groups working on it. That's great. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's like we, we look at, is this accessible to everyone? It's like, sure, if you want uh, that Mandalorian stage or that, you know, that triple A production kind of facility, you know, that's not available to everyone. Uh, but there are technologies and ways of doing this in a scalable manner uh, that are reasonable. Um, I, you know, you, you can buy off the shelf uh tracking systems like the HTC Vive. Um, you, you can uh, use Unreal Engine for free. So it's like, it's one of the few content creation packages that, that are free to use. It's like, you, you don't have to go out and buy a license to start with. Um, you, can, you can run it on, a, on pretty much a, a beefed up um, computer, uh, a home gaming computer. Uh, if you're doing it on that smaller scale. So I think it does allow everyone. And I think as you go through YouTube, you know, there's the, the Matt Workmans, um, who is a, a, a YouTuber who has worked in the film industry. And now he's kind of really embracing the indie nature of uh, virtual production. And he's really helping the community understand how indie filmmakers can use this technology um, in, in some scale. Right. So, I mean, I, I spent 16 years in visual effects from the very early on when there was no 3D and until there was 3D. But um, one thing that I came across was directors telling us that when, when we were trying to get our shots, we were impeding the creative process. Matt, how are you going to get past this barrier? Because obviously they're even perceptively even more contained um, in their own minds, even though theoretically there's, they're more, they can be more creative. I guess it all depends on how you work with these creatives. I think I've been fortunate over the years is if you um, kind of bring in directors and filmmakers early on in the process, they do kind of embrace uh, the technology and the opportunity um, of what these things bring to them creatively. So, you know, I think it's all to do with uh, each of, uh, you know, the different visual effects companies or the virtual production companies and how they engage with um, directors, cinematographers, producers, um, and involve them in the process early, early enough that they then kind of embrace it. And I do think that I think we're seeing a lot more filmmakers trying to embrace this technology based off of what they're seeing with the results. Mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. of the some of the shows that have uh, recently used virtual production mm -hmm. yeah nancy I, i've i've been lucky enough to be on uh in fact on a few calls with matt um with with directors that are looking at this technology and, and looking at whether you know it makes sense to them and and honestly once you start going through what the capabilities are and the ability to see some of these things in real time for the most part I, you know i don't have a giant sample but you know, for the most part, the, the, the directors I've been speaking with actually get excited about it. They, 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 they love the idea that, hey, I'm going to get to see the visual effects that I'm shooting. Pfft, wow, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I can change the time of day. I can move a mountain. I can do like at the, in real time. Yeah. It, half the time, they don't even believe it. I, I, I've seen a very positive impact, at least in the small sample of four or five directors I've spoken to since, since uh, we've been working on this. Uh, uh, they've been, you know, e extremely positive. Yeah, you know, I think there's a, I've got a, a great example of uh, recently uh, a director, he was talking about storyboards. And I was like, well, storyboards are great, but we can very quickly now do almost real-time previs yeah. where we can do this as like a, a real-time previs for virtual production. And, and you can get cut sequences within a day that you can and watch and, and they're gonna look really nice and, and you'll be able to re-edit them and cut them around way before you start shooting. And, and when he started seeing those kinds of opportunities, he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I, I you know, he still, he knows he still needs some of those things like some basic storyboards, mm -hmm. but very quickly he can get um, a product uh, of an edit 
that allows him to really think about uh, his his creative show, um, film or TV. Fantastic. Can we pivot a bit to talent? Because I know when I look at all the jobs board, all I see is looking for a hundred Unreal Engine people. <laughs> Um, what are we doing uh, to to create these jobs, and and is it a creation of jobs or is it a transfer of jobs from from traditional visual effects to um, virtual? I think that, uh, to be fair, I think a lot of it will be a transfer. Mm -hmm. I think we are transitioning people over from traditional ways of doing visual effects into using real time technologies, using Unreal Engine, Unity, any of these other kind of real time. Mm -hmm. Uh, softwares. Um, so we are, and I think v the first thing we do is we look at people who have the closest skill sets, and those are visual effects artists. Um, and we're going to try and transfer skills, for, uh, help them to transfer their skills um, into these new jobs. I think some of the, there have been some very cool things that have been happening within the industry over the last year or so. Um, I was fortunate enough um, to be involved um, and I actually was uh, selected to be a part of the Unreal Fellowship, uh, which was a five week training program run by uh, Epic Games that had, it ended up with a hundred of us worldwide having five week full-time training from uh, some, some of the most talented uh, Unreal Engine and virtual production uh, talent there is. Um, and at the end of it, we all made our own short film. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that they'd, uh, I know Epic are doing more and more of that. Um, I know a lot of companies are being given uh, bespoke training from uh, these uh, software companies uh, to retrain people in their software. So would, would it be um, a smart move for some post-secondary education facilities to get involved in, in, a, in training? Well, in fact, to some extent, they, they already are. Um, so uh, AMT is involved in a project right now with uh, Capilano University uh, called the CTC uh, project, which is the Creative Technology Community Project. Uh, and, you know, this, this actually was announced by us in an MOU almost a year and a half ago. And, and because of you know, the impact of COVID and the, the, you know, growing adoption of virtual production technologies, they've revamped their curriculum completely towards virtual production uh, and working with, you know, they, they're getting a, they're getting a, an LED wall and volumetric capture and all the things that they want to train their students on. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that um, uh, at, at least those focused in, in the digital media industry from a training and, and curriculum perspective perspective in post-secondary are definitely refocusing towards virtual production now and realize that there's going to be a demand for those students. Um, and certainly, you know, Capilano University is, is one of those ones that we're directly involved with taking those steps. Uh, and, and luckily they've had the opportunity to, to talk with companies like Versatile uh, to help them shape their curriculum. Um, we did get a chance to present to the Animation Visual Effects Alliance um, Oh, sometime beginning of last year. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's something that uh, um, the, the industry associations and the post-secondary institutions need to start collaborating on and taking a look at what type of changes they might want to make to their curriculum, uh, what type of spot training they might be able, might be able to offer. As, as Matthew mentioned, there was only 100 people worldwide that, that, that got to go through that program. Yeah. So skills transfers programs from universities would also be pretty, uh, pretty useful as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I'm starting to see that coming. And the universities, I think, do realize that they're going to have to start to make some adaptions to their curriculum to adopt these things. Um, but I think the, the better they can interact directly with, with the industry, as they figure those things out, the better off they're going to be. Right. And so Anthony, as a, as a local entrepreneur, um, how do you see us doing, BC as a province, uh, in the virtual production space? Are we, are we poised to be a, a mecca like we are in visual effects animation? Um, what are you seeing? I, I absolutely think so. I mean, a lot of the technologies around virtual reality, for example, I think uh, Vancouver is ranked third in the world uh, uh, for, for virtual reality. 
uh, AI and the adoption of AI technologies to, to do image recognition and, and, and um, uh, image processing to work out things like real-time muscle movement and things like that, that's being pioneered here in, in BC. Uh, we have great co new companies like Versatile that are you know, adopting full virtual production pipelines. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think Vancouver is absolutely poised to be a, a mecca um, for virtual production. Uh, and you know, I, there's, there's lots of studios here that have traditional pipelines and, and uh, are, are kind of looking at it in a little bit of a different light. I'm curious to know how many of those are starting to think about adopting virtual production pipelines and virtual production technologies like Unreal Engine. Um, um, but, you know, uh, just, just from what I can see in being able to interact with lots of different studios and talk about these things, uh, I'm definitely seeing a big groundswell. And I think we've got the, uh, both the talent and the, and the, the, you know, industry wherewithal to make it happen and really make Vancouver a, a, a mecca for virtual, duck, for virtual production. So Matt, um, what are you? What are your thoughts? I mean, your mothership is not from BC. Why did they choose BC? And what are your some of your future plans for Versatile? So yeah, well, first of all, let me just say yeah. I think I am seeing like a, a lot of the traditional VFX houses look at the opportunities of uh, what they can do within the visual production space, um, and I think it's just a natural progression for them. Um, for us at Versatile. Um, before, a long, long before I became on board, uh, they actually looked worldwide at where they wanted to locate um, their North American office uh, for the for the for working uh, on uh, the Western projects, uh, like the the projects for the Netflixes and the uh, the streaming services and the studios here, uh, rather than just focusing uh, on the Chinese market. Um, after about a year of uh, looking uh, they chose Vancouver um, for, probably for there was two main reasons as I understand it one the location to Hollywood uh, and two uh, the opportunity to uh, take uh, and work with a talent pool of VFX artists and help kind of reposition them into virtual production uh, and as far as the versatile media goes I think it's important to note when we're not a visual effects company uh, we have come here very specifically to focus on uh, the end-to-end -end kind of uh, solutions for virtual production. <coughs> uh, we have uh, we've actually uh, bought uh, a, a location here. Uh, we're not uh, we're not here just uh, in the short term. We've actually set down roots and we've bought a twelve thousand square foot um, location. Uh, that we have uh, currently just finishing up the renovations uh, that uh, include two uh, 4,000 square foot virtual production real-time animation stages uh, that are fully equipped with the latest technology uh, for performance uh, capture uh, in real time. Uh, and for us, we're going to be powered uh, with Unreal Engine um, behind that. Um, and uh, like our first part of our plan is will be to produce uh, virtual production real-time content, um, specifically episodic animation uh, for a more adult audience. Um, and then over the course of this year, uh, we will be announcing our first LED stage uh, that will be a, a very large uh, construct uh, we're fortunate, as I said, with uh, our Chinese uh, parent company that they've all already been operating uh, an LED stage uh, in China uh, for the last seven or eight months, putting productions through it. Uh, and their stage is, is uh, quite a significant stage at, uh, I think it's 25 meter diameter by six meters in height. Um, and, and we plan on uh, building something uh, slightly larger than that. Great. Um, well, I think we've run out of time. Good afternoon. Welcome to the virtual production in BC um, panel. For those of you who have had the opportunity to watch the pre-recorded, um, welcome back. And those of you who didn't, um, please take a look. Um, a lot of your questions may be answered as well, but uh, this will both be both on the website together in the future.
Uh, my name is Nancy Bassey. And this is the live Q&A portion of the panel. So I'd like to welcome back uh, Anthony Brown from AMP Technologies and Matt Welford, the Director of Virtual Production and Creative Director of Versatile Media. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Nancy. Okay. Yeah. Before we jump on the Q&A questions, I thought we would just circle back on a little bit on, um, on the education um, and um, talent portion, because like I said, I've seen a ton of jobs both in visual effects and animation and games, desperately needing um, people in virtual production. So can you guys give us a little bit, I know, Anthony, you talked a little bit about Capilano and Matt, you talked a little bit about the Unreal um, Fellowship. I thought maybe, Matt, can you explain, do a, do a bit deeper dive on the fellowship and what that is and how, how, that, how the process is? Sure, yeah, so I was fortunate enough to be uh, like uh, someone who was selected uh, to participate uh, in the fellowship uh, or one of the uh, the cohorts of the fellowship. Uh, I did it uh, in the summer uh, last year. Um, and I think as everyone knows, there was over 6,000 applicants. Um, and at the time they were only gonna take 50 uh, people. They ended up taking a hundred. They took 50 from North America uh, and they took 50 from Europe. Um, and how it worked was we, basically worked for five weeks um, where we had classes every day. It was a full-time thing. Um, and we worked uh, with educators from Epic Games um, uh, who basically ran through a whole program to teach us. And the way that they did it uh, was in a really interesting way was they, they set us a challenge to make our own little short film uh, in, in Unreal. Um, and, and the skill levels were from or, you know, from a, a very wide uh, gambit of like visual effects supervisors who haven't been on a box in, in many years uh, to, to previous artists, to modelers, to effects guys. Um, there was even some producers. We, we even had someone from uh, AWS who was a, a business development manager, I believe, at AWS who isn't a creative. Um, and over the course of the five weeks, um, whilst we were working on our short films, they gave us a, a curriculum uh, that we we worked through to help us achieve creating this little short one or two minute film. Uh, and I think those films are all now available uh, online. Um, but yeah, no, it was a fantastic experience. I, I went in with the very limited uh, Unreal knowledge. You know, obviously I have a, a wealth of experience in visual effects and, and, and the creative industries, uh, but I hadn't really used Unreal. Um, and it really helped me understand uh, how to utilize uh, Unreal and where Unreal has a place now um, in both virtual production and, and in filmmaking in general. Okay, Anthony, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the skill sets for Unreal are, are uh, you know, definitely need to be transferred. I mean, we're, we're, you know, so there's lots of folks out there from the video game industry who've been working with Unreal for years and, and, you know, understand Unreal Editor and so on. But just the fact that you've worked with Unreal as a video game developer uh, certainly would help, but I don't think it's a, a complete, you know, uh, training to understand how to utilize Unreal in a virtual production pipeline. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the steps that they're taking at, at Unreal to start to educate those people. And I think, it needs to spread beyond those kind of industry-led or, or industry-run curriculums and get into, you know, academia and into the universities. And, and you know, they, they, they need to understand that this is the direction that the, that the training needs to go. And, and I, think they, I think they're getting it. I mean, certainly the, the universities that I've been speaking with, and I did mention Capilano University before, um, are, are seeing virtual production and virtual production-specific uh, skill sets as as something to adopt for their curriculums, uh, and I think we'll see more and more of that as that goes on. I think they're aware now. I think industry is 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 made enough noise about uh, those the requirement for those skill sets, and that the the universities will start to adopt those those uh, um, skill sets into their curriculum or, or the training for those skill sets into their curriculum. And so, are we seeing uh, like Unity and Unreal wanting to partner with with the universities? Um, you know, I, I've seen some announcements around that. Uh, in I, I don't have direct experience with that myself. Um, the, there, there are some good examples out there, and I would expect that to be the case moving forward. 
Um, uh, in the case of, of the CTC program that we're working on at, at Capilano, um, uh, you know, that will be part of the outreach is to work directly with those, those uh, uh, suppliers of technology, just as they have done with Autodesk and with all the other players that have been out there, they'll do the same thing with with the with the likes of Unreal. And Unreal seems very positive and very open to to doing that. I think that's part of how they've gained the traction that they have. So, Matt, what would do you have any advice for any current artists who are just who are wanting to get into virtual production? Any kind of Cole's notes? Uh, well, for me, the, what I've been telling people is first of all. Um, there is a wealth of, of training online um, for, especially for Unreal, they've got a whole learning platform. Um, and pretty much anyone who has come to me uh, recently who's looking to move into virtual production, I've kind of guided them into just go ahead and learn the basics, the core uh, understanding of something like Unreal. Uh, there's also a lot of YouTube channels uh, that focus on virtual production. Uh, but for like, for myself at Vistal, uh, we're already looking at how we're going to uh, either bring in uh, interns or how we're going to bring in people from the industry and cross train them there in, in virtual production. So, and I think that will be the case for a lot of uh, virtual production companies uh, that we will take the onus, to, especially in the short term. In the short term, we know that there's going to be a shortage um, of experienced virtual production people. Uh, we've got job titles that people have never even heard of before. Mm. Um, and we're not even quite sure what those jobs actually fully entail yet it's like it, it reminds me of 25 years ago in visual effects where we were making up job titles um just just because we didn't quite know what the roles were um so i know for us and i know for other companies that i've talked with uh, they're willing to take the onus of bringing people in uh, experienced visual effects and games uh, programmers uh, developers um and kind of work with them and, and train them over the course of several months obviously we don't want to throw people um onto a live a live set uh, with a, an led wall uh, until they're ready um and you know it'll be our responsibility uh, to make sure that uh, people are fully prepared uh, for the roles that they have uh, and i think you know from what uh, anthony said as well you know i've i've had conversations with other universities uh, with other training managers at uh, various visual effects companies uh, around town, specifically in BC. Um, and, and we're already talking about how we can partner with them. Uh, we're going to have kind of the tools, we're going to have the, the LED stages, we're going to have the, uh, the virtual production animation stages available. And it's how can we actually help train some of the people, even if they're not within our company, um, to to benefit BC because ultimately it's going to benefit myself. It's going to uh, benefit the community. Um, great, yeah. And I think um, that's what's going to happen. So we do have a question and I just want to, to preface it again with, um, you know, we have a 40 year legacy in this uh, province of film, visual effects, animation, games, um, and government support has been a key um, to the growth. Um, so the question is, is the province leveraging industry partnerships or programs to promote the idea of a virtual production mecca? Anthony, do you want to do you want to take a crack at that first? Oh, well, um, I, you know, I, I can't say that personally, I know <coughs> exactly what's going on in the government's uh, collective brain. Uh, I do know that it's a good thing that uh, you know there's certainly some champions that have that have come into the new administration recently with Brenda Bailey, for example, um, uh, who was executive director of DigiBC, and she she certainly has uh, does get it, and we've had some opportunities to talk with her. Uh, we've 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 spoken in the past with with um, uh, Mr. Rolston, uh, and 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 talked about the what's coming around virtual production. There, there is no. I haven't been told in, in, of any specific virtual production programs, how uh, from the government. However, certainly all the the digital media credits that exist today will apply to virtual production, uh, and that, that's been confirmed to me. And then there are specific programs in place through both the supercluster, uh, the capacity building program, various other. Um, uh, government funding sources and academia, especially that that seems to be a big theme for them is trying to get academia and industry to work together to help build out uh, kind of the the you know making Vancouver and, and British Columbia a a serious point of presence in virtual production. Um, 
but you know because I think and I think that's a good approach because it's going to be companies like Versatile uh, and, and others who build out that uh, that infrastructure here in 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 BC, and that's what's going to drive us to be a mecca. So it's going to come from the province supporting industry, and I think the way that they're going about it is leveraging existing programs, working with the super cluster and doing capacity building and that sort of stuff, and then bringing in uh, academia to help support, uh, um, you know, on the on the ground training and and training facilities to get people up to speed on on the uh, on the technology. But you know, and can that, I say this is what the plan is for the provincial government? N no. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and there's a lot of existing programs already that. Um, um, are, are strong. Obviously, uh, and immigration is, is important if we need to bring in some talent, um, research and development tax credits. There's quite a few um, talent initiatives that help uh, pay for part salaries and things like that. So that, that, that's awesome. So Matt, you, um, um, your company is not based in Vancouver, but chose Vancouver as a destination. So what are you seeing as far as municipal um, federal and provincial government support? Uh, yeah, so like obviously our, our, our home base is uh, in Hangzhou in uh, China. And uh, they, and before I joined the company, uh, they did a lot of research and uh, they chose Vancouver uh, to base like our initial uh, office uh, and, and production facility here. Um, I know that there's been discussions with the government, um, but ultimately it's, aside from uh, what the government uh, will do to help virtual production is like you know we we located here because of uh, the strength in the visual effects community and the film communities here because there's such a direct link between like visual effects and, and, and filmmaking and virtual production um, and I think it'll be companies like us we will be going to the government and kind of highlighting what we do what is different about what we do and what supports we need and so I think those discussions are now all now starting to really happen uh, because the government is seeing like the extensive investments, companies like Vistel Media, um, and there are other companies in town here who are, you know, making significant investments, you know, to build one of these LED stages is a, a multi-million pound investment. Um, or dollars, and, you know. Or <laughs> well, oh, dollars, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's a, a dollars, pounds. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, it will, you know, I think it will drive the government to seriously look at virtual production. Uh, and those conversations have started, and I think they will be very much ongoing uh, during the course of this year. Okay, that's great. And so there has been some studies done that, that it believes that virtual production will be the norm by, by 2026. I don't know why they picked that number, but, but I'd just love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, you go uh, first, Matt. <laughs> Look, for, for, for me, it's like whenever they say these things, um, it's it's people trying to create stories. Um, do I think that there will be significant use of virtual production uh, over the next five to 10 years? Yes. Do, do I think it will be the norm? I, I don't know. Um, like I think we... we I've said this previously. It's like a motion... I remember motion capture 20 years ago where we there was this scare tactic, oh my God, mocap is gonna be, you know, there's no longer gonna be animators and everything's gonna be mocap. Well, that, that's not the case really. Mocap is a significant part of, uh, you know, the creative industries now, but it hasn't necessarily taken away all of the jobs uh, in keyframe animation. Um, and I think it'll be the same for virtual production. I think it will get used. Um, and again, it is about using the technology to tell great stories. As long as that's what we're doing and we're not just creating technology for the sake of technology, then I, I think we will have lost our way if, that, if, if that's what happens in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Matt. I think, you know, uh, um, I've heard things like virtual production is the, the biggest thing that happened to visual effects since the advent of the computer uh, is one of the, uh, one of the articles that I read on, on the, you know, kind of future of virtual production. But I think you're right. I think it, it will be adopted more and more. There certainly is a lot of demand and, and, and uh, a lack of supply currently going on for virtual production stages and facilities. Uh, and so I think, you know, that will start to even out. And that means that there will be a lot more going on in that space. But, you know, there's so much that goes into virtual production 
um, that's still, you know, growing and meshing together. Uh, things around volumetric capture, uh, uh, not just mocap, but volumetric capture itself and how that gets implemented, uh, implementation of AI uh, and, and being able to apply AI algorithms to, to give more real-time uh, reactions to models, things like that, uh, applying physics. I mean, there, there's so much that is, is still coming and still being worked on um, that we don't really have a, a, a true picture of what virtual pr production will be by 2026. Um, you know, you know, ask Matt about when he was working on Avatar uh, and they were doing all this stuff that would be considered virtual production, but they didn't call it that then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's, it's it, certainly there's been a big increase w around number one, the LED walls and, and the implementation of using real time um, uh, uh, environments with, uh, with the LED walls. Um, but there's been a constant evolution and there will continue to be a constant evolution around virtual production. Um, and so, you know, just saying, will virtual production be the norm? What part, um, yeah. you know, what facet of it, um, you know, there will be things that will change a traditional pipeline shop that would be considered virtual production, even though somebody else may not consider that being virtual production. I mean, you can do virtual production without an, an LED wall, right? So does that mean you're not virtual production? Those sorts of things are going to are going to be, you know, kind of what impacts the future as we as we look at it. And we, we talk about the death, like we keep hearing about the death of cinema right now, going to the movie theater. And so, yeah, in five years time, is there going to be a new way to view content? maybe there's going to be a new way to view content that is symbiotic with virtual production that uh, elevates how you can use virtual production to create um, a creative viewing experience. So, yeah. you know, I think, you know, I think it's exciting. There's a, there's a lot of amazing things that are going to happen probably over the next five to 10 years that I am excited to be involved in. Um, so we have a, we have a question who wants to get a bit more personal on this issue. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have any kind of, uh, what, what, what are you most excited about for the next one to three years? I, I, I saw that question come in there from Jessica. I totally, I totally, uh, <laughs> I want to answer that one. So for me, look, I'm a video game guy. Uh, you know, I, I was, I was the running a, a video game publishing company um, uh, when I was doing content as opposed to tech. Uh, and I think that what's really exciting is how once f uh, film and linear production gets really in deep into Unreal Engine and, uh, and, and, and what these things can do, what might that change in a viewer's experience? How interactive might it become in the future uh, if you're doing real-time render and real-time graphics uh, associated with your production, does that mean that one day you'll interact with a movie uh, or interact with a with a television show in some way? Uh, be it just as you know, being able to move a camera around a volumetric image, or 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 you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be interacting with the storyline. Even like, it, it, there's so much that might happen there, and I don't, I'm not predicting anything. Um, I'm just, I, I'm just really excited to see what happens around the the meshing of video game technologies in the interactive digital media space coming together with the linear film and television digital media space and what's gonna what what new form of entertainment might pop out of that well i think we saw a little bit of that in the virtual reality space i remember being at the tribeca film festival and the viewer was part of the storytelling so i think that you're exactly right that's gonna that's gonna blow up for sure what about you, you, Matt? What about you, Matt? I don't know. I, like you know, I'm I'm thinking what what you know, what am I excited about in the next one to three years? It's like as a technology standpoint, I think myself and a lot of people are very excited about what Unreal Five is going to bring to the virtual production table. Um, from a uh, from that, but no, I think what I, I think for what excites me with virtual production. Uh, and for the next one to three years is where storytellers are going to take the technology to tell better stories. Um, yes. It's yes. like it's going to allow people to tell stories um, and, you know, do things that we traditionally may not have done in the past. And that's what excites me 
you know, if that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's, I think it's, there's, it's, it's just, uh, everybody's mind is blowing. So yeah. I, I think that the, the barriers are, are lowering. So this one I think is for you, Matt. This next one says, uh, there's been a talk of idle inventory with virtual production studios. Is that the case for BC facilities? I'm not quite sure. I don't quite understand the question, if I'm honest. Idle inventory. Yeah, that's uh, maybe we can ask, what does idle inventory mean exactly? Is, you know, if if they're saying that are there idle, you know, idle resources within virtual production, I'm not sure because I don't know of that many virtual production studios in BC. Um, there's a lot of uh, visual effects companies in town, but I don't know of uh, many virtual production specific companies. Um, and again, it, it, virtual production is such a, a wide uh, and broad kind of area of filmmaking. Um, most virtual production companies are, they're, they're not idle uh, right. because they're not, it, it, you know. Yeah, if he's referring to idle inventory of studios, like virtual production facilities built into studios and them not having projects in them, um, that I am not seeing at all. What I'm seeing is uh, um, virtual production facilities getting built and then getting booked for two years, uh, even before they're finished being built. Um, so, uh, you know, that, in fact, you know, I'm not engaged with a huge sample of virtual production studios. Uh, you know, it's only, only a, a handful. So I don't have a giant sample across the industry. But in that handful, that is the case with every one of them, that they already have you know, this stage is booked. Once, like, can, can we get it built any faster, please? Right. So, but yeah, if you want to follow up that question uh, with any more specifics, we'll try and dig deeper into it for you. Um, I mean, I think that uh, especially with um, what we've learned through the pandemic and being and having backup there, I think the virtual production space is here to stay. <laughs> I can't see it getting smaller. Um, we have another question. Um, what do you think might be something that is often overlooked by clients who have just started to dip their toes into virtual production? Oh, I don't know. It's that's an open ended. <laughs> it's an open ended question. Look, if when uh, when clients um, contract a virtual production company, um, if it's a <clears throat> If it's a, a very good virtual production company with a great virtual production supervisor um, and, and, a, and a good team, they're there to really educate the clients on what virtual production can and can't do. Um, and that's been my experience is, is talking with some of these other virtual production companies and uh, not necessarily in BC, but uh, in LA specifically is um, those those companies with great virtual production supervisors are there to guide and lead the clients so that they don't overlook things. Um, and again, I think the biggest thing that um, as a broad statement that gets, uh, and it's not really overlooking is the understanding what virtual production is. Uh, right now, a lot of filmmakers think the LED stages of like Mandalorian, um, are that is virtual production and they're not really fully aware of everything that virtual production is from from uh location skating from uh previs uh from virtual cinematography you know the list is is quite extensive virtual art department um i think that's what's being overlooked right now is actually the breadth of what virtual production is um, and it's not just the that end product of final pixel LED stages. Um, you know, for, from my perspective, certainly what I'm dealing with is on the technology infrastructure front. So that's that's what I get the most most insight into. Uh, I will say that it's you know there, there's a lot that goes into enabling uh, from a technology perspective a virtual production pipeline. And sometimes there's a, there may be a tendency to, you know, forget about things like, you know, hey, we might need to adopt Perforce uh, as part of our pipeline, or uh, we we might need to, you know, how many how many GPUs does it actually take to run one of these LED walls? You know, you got your your LED wall and the controllers are all set, right? No, no, you you know, you need a, a whole bunch of other. Uh, systems to be able to run virtual production live and 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 it 
it, you know, there's still lots of, of, of figuring out to do depending on the project and depending on scene sizes and, and resolutions and pixel pitches and all of these. There's, there's a million different factors that go into determining what the best infrastructure is to run all this stuff. And I think sometimes that might be a little bit overlooked. It's not, it's, there's, there's so many different moving parts that impact each other that, it, that there's a, a good process that should be undertaken when you're looking at adopting a virtual production pipeline to be able to support the artists that are creating that content. Actually, let me just, there's two other things. One is the time it takes to set up a virtual production in, in total is sometimes clients are coming to companies thinking that we can just turn on an LED wall tomorrow and they can start shooting. So I think timing is a big thing that is currently overlooked that doesn't get really talked about. Um, and then the other thing that is often overlooked right now, um, if they're not directed correctly, um, is the amount of decisions that have to be made earlier in the process. So you have to make a lot more decisions earlier in the process than, than they've ever been used to before. They always used to be able to push everything into post-production. Now, <laughs> now, post. <laughs> now post-production now post -production has actually moved to the head of the line. And we have to do a lot of that decision-making now. And for virtual production to be a valuable a resource, you have to make very smart decisions earlier and stick to those decisions. And I think we're seeing a lot of people talk about, oh, they'll make these decisions, but then they're going to change their mind afterwards. Yeah. Yes, that might happen. Yes, it always does. But look, when they decide to build a set, 95% of the time that set is the set. And there's only 5% of the time that they, in post, will either adjust, change, fix, whatever you want to call it. And I think virtual production will be the same. Okay, cool. Um, question from Rod. Uh, what is the best way to make the transition from game dev Unreal Engine to virtual production and film and TV? Is it best to be an Unreal 3D generalist or try and break in as a specialist, i.e. Uh, environment artist, tech artist, previs? Good question. Uh, for me, it's look, the one thing uh, that I learned from doing the fellowship um, is that we're moving back towards um, a world where we get more generalists uh, because in a program like Unreal or Unity or any of these uh, game engines, often you, you don't get side, uh, sidelined into one small narrow pathway. Um, it opens up the, uh, your, the opportunity for you to do a little bit of lighting, a little bit of modeling, you know, even adding mocap to, uh, to characters. Um, so for me, I think it's start off with that Unreal 3D generalist idea, just learn the basics um, and then, you know, try and find those, those jobs uh, to come in. Um, and that's when we'll help uh, define what your role will be in the long term. Some people will want to stay on the box doing things like uh, environment creation and, and, and world building. Other people want to be on set uh, controlling Unreal uh, controlling the screens so uh, and it'll be it's going to take a little bit of time for people to adjust to exactly what they want to do in virtual production great um anthony do you have anything to add to that one no i think you know certainly matt is more qualified to answer that question than i am um uh and you know i so i i i defer to matt on on that question although i did see a question come up in chat Yes, I was um, going to do that one next um, yeah. from Dennis. Uh, do you see the future of virtual production as a service rental or an extension of what is required for image creation? I think all of the above. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be any one defined thing. Um, I think there's going to be some rental stages and some rental. There's, I, I know of some of the major studios uh, who are looking at building their own virtual production facilities um, to support then uh, the visual effects vendors that they already bring in. Um, so I, I, it's going to be a little bit of everything, I think, especially over the next, you know, five years. Uh, but we are yeah. seeing a huge growth of a lot of people trying to fire up virtual production companies. Um, so how many, you know, is there going to be enough in, in five years time, is there going to be enough work for all of them? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing an explosive growth right now of a lot of people 
like either taking their current businesses and transitioning into a, a virtual production. Um, and then there's other people who are just completely booting up brand new companies uh, okay. to do just virtual production. So we have a specific question from somebody who says, I am a systems admin desk support for Post Studio. I am really interested in jumping into virtual production in Vancouver. What would be the best path to transition? Well, I, uh, first thing is you, you're going to definitely need to know your GPU tech. Um, as, as far as being a system, you know, if you're looking at applying your systems administration skill set to virtual production, that's going to be, you know, knowing your GPU, knowing your NVIDIA, knowing your, your um, uh, uh, back end on, on how those GPUs are used for virtual production, things like NVLink and being able to, lo you know, deal with large scenes and all that fun stuff. That would be one of the things I think is going to be challenges for the system uh, assist, new sysadmins coming down the pipe, when they you know when the, the the somebody from production is saying I can't load the scene the wall's not running where's Bob um, you know it's going to be Bob that has to run in and and you know figure out how to how to get that you know enough NV RAM or whatever uh, is required to be able to get that to run so I think I think that might be one area of focus. Um, and then, you know, other than that, there's a, you know, th these, these, there's people like Versatile out there that are advertising. Um, and and uh, if, if I was looking to make a move into virtual production, uh, I think there's probably a lot of jobs out there already of people looking for uh, um, people that at least have, this is the thing, there's just not a lot of virtual production experience already out there. Yeah. So a lot of companies are, are happy if you've got some experience in VFX in general. So the, the anonymous um, uh, person asking the question is saying that he already works for a post studio. So, you know, that's an advantage already. Uh, and I think if you just wanted to try and make the leap, there's a lot of people out there looking for people that at least have that level of experience to be able to show up and, 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 and jump in and learn just like everybody else is at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, I think everything Anthony said is, is right um, about the areas you need to focus on. And then you've got to, you know, you, you go and research as much about real time as possible and understand what does compute mean to real time um, and how they work together. Because those are the people who are going to be useful to us is who can help problem solve uh, like real time problems uh, with uh, creating computer networks and uh, creating computer systems that, that operate uh, real-time software. Right. Um, and then we have another question here, moving it back to um, BC and what's going on here. Uh, it says, where do you think BC has a head start in relation to virtual production? I mean, you've both been in, you, you're here, you've, you've- Well, they got, we got, we got, we got, you know, Matt, and versatile, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> um, we, we got uh, we got amped uh, to, to help out, to help kid out the studios that are uh, that are want to move in that direction. Uh, no, uh, um, you know, I, where do we already have a head start? Well, there's one good thing uh, that I can point out there, and that is that Vancouver is one of those places that doesn't only have a fairly mature uh, VFX and animation uh, uh, industry but it also has a very mature game industry. Um, and so the fact that we have that, and I think rated number three in the world for virtual reality uh, and uh, in the top 10 as well around AI, all of those technologies are applicable to virtual production and the future of where vir virtual production is going. And I think we do have definitely a head start from a talent perspective and experience perspective and an industry focused perspective. I think we gotta be careful, we have to leverage it. We have to you know, uh, lobby government to, to you know, add additional tax incentives. We've got, you know, we, we, we have to compete with the likes of Montreal and, and Adelaide and, and Australia and all of these, these um, you know, uh, geographical areas that are applying lots of tax credits and lots of incentives to drive companies that wanna do virtual production to that geography. And I think we, we're going to need to focus on that um, as far as, you know, a lobby group and as an industry back to, back to government to help enable us to do that. But we, we've got a great foundation to jump off of, and I think that's where we already have the head start. We just have to, to shepherd that, that resource 
into becoming a, a you know global leader for virtual production. Yeah, I, I'd say like our talent pool and, and our experience in visual effects, gaming, um, and just technology in general, um, because you know we've got the likes of Microsoft here. Um, with uh, you know a lot of smart people who are, have got extensive backgrounds in real time AI machine learning, all of these things are very valid in, in virtual production, and it's just about probably over the next two to three years really helping uh, grow that um, and trying to cement our place um, with virtual production because um, we know that it's you know everywhere there's stages popping up all around the world there's you know, companies popping up all over the place, um, uh, but we are in a in a reasonably strong position. Uh, well, yeah, and, and I would just like to add that we have places like Beyond Capture and Animatrix who are doing a lot of the motion capture, integrating virtual production. Animism is working on virtual production. There's probably at least half a dozen animation studios that are looking at virtual production for, for animation on the Unreal side. So there's a lot of people working in this space um, quietly and setting some setting some parameters for the future. I, so for me, I, I feel very uh, confident about that. And for anybody who's looking for um, jobs, if you don't know already, there's a website called vfxvancouver.com. And every company in visual effects and animation and some game companies post jobs on there. Um, the HR people know to do that. So keep an eye on that, um, that site as well, if you're looking for opportunities. <clears throat> so I think that sounds like that's it for the questions, you guys. Any more? Any, Any more? more? <laughs> Come on, Alberto, I know you've got a question. <laughs> Well, we have a nice big group of 30, 33 people watching, so that's exciting. I'm glad it, it, it uh, created a lot of interest, and I think that a lot of people see this as a potentially uh, next move for their careers, and um, and it's exciting. And I know that uh, being in this, this type of industry, we love to know kind of what's happening next and how to be part of it. So I feel like you've got a lot, uh, a lot of people who are going to be following you guys um, to find out um, what the next steps are. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, the last the last question was thanks for all your insight there from. Oh. Mateo. So you're, 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 thanks, Mateo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and again, uh, if, if you missed the uh, the panel discussion before, you can find that on the Spark website. It's a half an hour discussion before we got into the live Q and A. So uh, take a peek at that. And um, and thank you all so much for showing up. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye, everybody.